Hey, what's going on, guys? It's me, General Sam, back at it again with another Forehead Fables podcast. This is like episode five or six or something. <laughs> I think it's five. And, uh, you know, this one, I'm just going uh, solo. It's just got to be me. Just got to be me yapping away. But don't worry, I got some interesting stuff I want to talk about. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm having a pretty good day. Because, uh, you know, I've been dieting. I'm not sure if you guys have realized, but I went from big, big, big fat boy to kind of fat boy. <laughs> and uh, and so I've been I haven't eaten carbs in a long time. Well, yesterday was my birthday. Dude, I fucked up an entire Boston cream pie. You know, I often uh, talk shit about my wife. And because, uh, you know, if you're married, why not? <laughs> What's she going to do? Dump me. And uh <laughs> And she's really like, I like being a cynical ass, but I mean, my life's pretty good. I sit in my house all day. Porn's right there. I, get, I, I eat dinner every day. I mean, like, what do I have to complain about, you know? And so the only thing I can complain about is marriage tension, which, uh, you know, my, my marriage is great, actually. I just like to complain about it because I know it pisses Abby off. But uh, this is the one time you're going to hear me praise that bitch. <laughs> the one time. No, I was, uh, she's a fucking great wife. You know what she did for me? It was my birthday, right? Birthday's on Monday. But of course, it, when you have family, everybody's got jobs and everything. They'll celebrate it over the weekend. So, uh, and my family can't keep it to fucking gather. Everybody's divorced and nobody wants to hang out with each other. So I had a, a separate birthday with one faction on Saturday and then another birthday on Sunday. Uh, you know, why can't everybody just stick together and be in fucking, just have a miserable marriage like me? Just stay together. Why do you have to get divorced, you know? And uh, so on Sunday, we had my uh, big birthday dinner with my family, we went to Hibachi and all that shit. And then, uh, and I was like, Abby, she was like, what kind of cake do you want? I was like, I want... I've been craving a Boston cream pie for a while. That's not a sex move. Get get your dirty mind out of here. Boston cream pie is like a cake layer, and it's got custard, and then cake again, and then a layer of chocolate on top. And it's possibly as close as you can get to having an orgasm without actually sticking your penis in anything. And uh, so I, you know, I wanted one of those. <laughs> Obviously, that's pretty high up on my uh, to eat list. So. I'm like, I want a Boston cream pie. She's like, all right, that's fine. I'll get you one of those. Come Sunday, we go out to Hibachi after uh, dinner. I'm like, where's my Boston cream pie? And she goes, no, honey, I ordered it for you for Monday on your birthday because I know that you'll just want to eat it by yourself. You get the whole thing to yourself. <laughs> that was possibly, in my 28 years of life, that was the nicest thing anybody's ever done to me. Because she knows I haven't had any serious carbs in, uh, in like six months or so. When that Boston cream pie came out of that refrigerator, I fucked that thing up. <laughs> Have you ever seen like those videos of uh, polar bears attacking seals? <laughs> and they drag them out of the fucking out of the water and just tear them up? That's what it looked like when I just grabbed that Boston cream pie out of the refrigerator. I went ham, egg, and cheese on that shit. And, and then this morning, there was a little bit left over. That's what I had for breakfast. I haven't eaten anything since because I just like the aftertaste of Boston cream pie in my mouth. Never thought I'd love a cream pie in my mouth quite this much. And, uh, and then the rest of my birthday, I spent uh, playing Minecraft VR, which was, that was you know possibly my greatest birthday, honestly. I, uh, I woke up, played Minecraft VR. Abby ordered me uh, Zaxby's chicken finger plate. Played some more Minecraft VR. Took a big shit. Uh, ate a Boston cream pie. <laughs> more Minecraft VR. Finished the day with uh, one game of League that we lost horribly. And that's it. That was the end of the day. <laughs> it was a great birthday. Did everything I wanted, which was nothing. Every year, someone tries to make you, I don't know if you guys have this, but on your birthday, you have to do shit. I, you know what I want to do on my birthday? Fucking nothing. I just want to live like American beauty style and just, I just want to do nothing. 
Wait, that's not American Beauty. That's office space. I want to do an office space style. And the UPS man just pulled up in front of my house, and he's bringing me my birthday present to myself. I bought myself a camera. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, turns out that my dog was just barking at nothing because the UPS man was not out there, and now I'm sorely disappointed. But it gave me time to think about what else I wanted to talk about. I remember a couple months ago, my mom was talking to me about uh, my grandma and how my grandma was getting scammed. Not scammed. She's, she's more susceptible to, to scam artists now because they, they send her like a letter and they're like, hey, I'm a Nigerian. You know, the whole Nigerian prince thing. It's basically that, but like not Nigeria. Like now people just hear Nigerian prince and they get fucking flipped out. But they just simply change the name. They're like, oh, I'm a diplomat from Budapest. <laughs> and uh, send me 580 bucks, and I'll send you 25000 They've realized that if they just turn the numbers down a lot, you know, uh, simply send me 500 bucks, I'll send you 25000 That's a That's, a, you know, what Warren Buffett might say, a pretty goddamn good investment. And uh, worst case scenario, you're out 500 bucks which is too small for, uh, like, I, I'm not sure if there's anything that's too small for small claims court, but are people really going to go out of their way to go to a small claims court for 500 bucks? Probably not. They, they have figured out, like, what is the minimum people are willing to get fucked out of, like, dollar-wise? So she falls for that shit. She hasn't fallen for it yet, but she keeps, like, coming to my mom with them, like, get-rich-quick schemes. And... um there's a reason why there's a scheme in there. <laughs> Anyways, she was talking to me about it, and she's like, "Is there some? Is it be? Is it? There's a couple factors here." She's like, "Is it because she's senile?" I'm like, "Old age has something to do with it." But also, this lady's been a stay-at-home mom her entire life, and she just has. She's just naive. She hasn't been out, and she's like a die-hard Christian. She just thinks better of the world than it is, and. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, you you just, she's just, I, I, and I don't understand it either. Because the lady reads the newspaper every day. I, I see her and she's over there flipping through it. And I'm like, you don't see these horrible headlines jumping out of every page. Like the world is a shitty place, right? And uh, it's full of shitty people. And they're trying to take advantage of you at every opportunity. That's all people are doing. And I feel like uh, gaming Growing up gaming has brought has made me extremely aware of how people are trying to fuck you out of stuff all the time. And I love it. You might think, oh, Sam, that's a cynical way of looking at things. Let me tell you something, dude. If people weren't trying to fuck me out of money my entire childhood, I would, I would have gotten scammed already in real life. But I haven't been because I was on multiplayer games. Name one multiplayer game growing up that there wasn't uh, at least once a week someone messaging you on Steam, on uh, fucking uh, Battle.net, something where they're trying to fuck you out of items, money, or whatever. And that was the most important lessons of my life because, uh, you know, if I, didn't, if I hadn't gotten fucked out of uh, items or whatever on Diablo 2, then... Uh, that would have left me really open to getting fucked out of real life money later in life. But uh, because I learned my lessons early, I'm a, as Aqua puts it, I'm a shrewd businessman because of Diablo 2. <laughs> nothing, nothing makes you more aware of scams than growing up playing Diablo 2 or uh, like any MMO or something like that. Like they, it's just full of people trying to take advantage of other people, and I fucking love it. I love it. That is the real. You know how like people say the the schoolyard is where the real schooling comes in. You know, like the recess. That's <laughs> MMOs are the business school of the youth, <laughs> and. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I was talking to my mom about it and I was like, I've never been fucking scammed and it's cause I'm street smart. And she comes at me and she's like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? You're just a little sniveling nobody. You know, you're, you lived your whole life pampered. 
You've never had, you've never been in a gang or anything like that. So stop fucking acting like it. And, uh, and she came at me with this sass, this attitude. And I was like, listen here, lady, you don't know the shit I went through growing up. All right. You thought I was just in my bedroom whacking off, looking at pictures of women's buttholes. That was half of it. That was granted. You are right, mom. That was half of my childhood, but the other half was spent in the cutthroat business world of Diablo 2. And let me tell you something. I took my lumps, but boy, I gave them out too. (laughs) That shit changed me, okay? You know how, like, I remember particularly one time I went out and uh, I I met this guy. And we were, um, it was in a trading lobby, right? And we were sitting there talking to each other he ended up becoming my friend he was like hey you want me to uh rush you through a couple that was like the thing was like helping each other rush characters that way you don't have to play the game legitly you have someone that's a higher level than you uh help you through because they have all the waypoints and everything and he did that and he gave me some items and stuff but nothing like good nothing like high tier just gave me some good items low level rune words stuff like that i'll keep i'll try to keep all the uh <laughs> all the jargon down to a minimum for people that haven't played that game. And uh, so he, he was taking me under his wing and this went on for like a week. Every day I'd play with this guy. He was a cool dude. Introduced me to a couple of his friends. I was like, Hey, this is awesome. I'm part of a group. You know, that's what every kid's searching for. Right. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I was like, dude, I've noticed whenever you're rushing me, this is a dungeon crawler game, right? He always knows where the entrance is to the next level because it's a randomized it's not completely random there's like eight or nine different variations for each level and so you would have to like crawl your way through the dungeon to find the entrance to the next level and he always knew which way to go he always knew i was like how do you fucking know every time he was like dude i got map hacks like oh map hacks that explains it and i think he did have map hacks in retrospect i do and I was like, hey, uh, can I get map hacks? <laughs> he was like, oh, sure. Why didn't you ask? Here you go, dude. He sends me a link. Now, this was before Battle.net says, don't follow links that people give you. Be wary of links. But I guarantee you situations like mine are what led to them doing that. Because what happened next? Basically tore my little nine-year-old heart out of it. Ah, just tore it out stomped all over it i clicked on that link and i downloaded uh some little exe and he was like click run on that i was like okay so i ran it and it took control of my character it it tapped me back into diablo 2 my character ran to the uh, the town stash dumped all my shit on the ground went back into my account like logged me out back to my account went into my next character, joined the game, dumped all my shit on the ground, went into my next character, went in the game, dumped all my shit on the ground until it had emptied every character in my account. And I'm sitting there like desperately trying to move my mouse and nothing worked. It just, and that was before I knew about like just turning off the computer. Right. And, uh, and this guy was in that room with all of his friends and they were in the worst part about it was they had like complete control of my computer the script did or whatever, this program. And, but I could still see what was happening. So I just had to sit there and watch <laughs> as this little kid, as all this shit, all my hard work got dumped on the ground. And then this guy that was supposed to be my friend and his friends that were supposed to be my friends were just laughing in chat. They thought it was fucking hilarious. All my shit got dumped on the ground and then it logged me out and I couldn't get back in. I think it like changed my password or something to just some random garbage before I logged out. And I was like, Jesus, goddamn Christ. That was, that was traumatic. It was honestly like another level traumatic for a nine year old. And I was telling my mom about this on the phone and she was like, Oh my God, why didn't you tell me? I was like, mom, because you so fucking understand. It, it, you had no frame of reference of why that was traumatic. You would have been like, oh, well, that sucks, honey. Like, she just didn't. You know what? When I was a kid, I was sitting there trying to show her my Pokemon cards, and she couldn't fucking wrap her dumb head around Diglett. 
you know, Diglett, the Pokemon, the, it's like a turd stuck in the ground. She like couldn't fucking wrap her head around that. And I was like, look, if you can't comprehend the, <laughs> the, the subtle nuances of Diglett and Doug Trio, then you're just, you're, you, you, you're out of your depth, mom. I can't fucking explain to you how I got scammed on Diablo 2. You're just not going to get it. All right. And I was like, I'm not even going to waste her time. Because I remember, uh, uh, those of you that play Diablo 2, once again, when, you're, when you find a public rusher, someone that's rushing a group of people, and you hop on that train, and you're sitting there following them, following them, and you're of the same level as the main guy that's getting rushed, that you know you're set for the entire game. Because you'll keep joining the next game with them, joining the next game with them, and they'll jump to the next act when... The main guy that's getting rushed reaches the proper level, which you're going to be leveling up at the same time because you're there experiencing the same shit as him, right? And uh, and my mom, like, I was halfway through a good rush, and my mom, she would do this all the time. Or if I was doing, like, bail runs or something, she would just, like, go, like, hey, honey, I'm going to call grandma. And I'd be like, listen here, bitch. We're on dial-up. <laughs> if you call her you're gonna cut the internet and i'm gonna I, it, it, this is this opportunity is gonna be gone for me and she's like just pause it just pause it i'll be on the phone for 10 minutes 15 minutes i'm like mom the opportunity will be over the fucking hill it'll be gone you don't understand she didn't understand i'm like mom do you know how many life experiences have been thwarted by you Talking to your fucking grandma, talking to my grandma about some dumb shit. I just, I, I, she just didn't understand. But it doesn't matter because her leaving me alone, leaving me in the trenches, taking grenades like that, being totally unaware of the shit that was happening. It really was. That's why I love that show Ed, Ed and Eddie so much because that show was like a, uh, it, wait, hold on, let me finish my previous thought. Her leaving me alone like that. Is what uh, is what made me realize, you know what, dude? She just doesn't understand. I gotta I gotta fend for myself, and that's why I love that show, Ed, Ed and Eddie. Because if you notice in that show, there's not a single goddamn adult, not a single one, dude. Those kids are in it for themselves. Ed, Ed, and Eddie are making scams, trying to fuck people out of their D two items to get jawbreakers. And I looked at those kids and I said, these are pioneers. These are kids that are standing up for themselves. That's what I can get behind. I love that show. That was awesome. The only thing I would have done differently, though, is if I was Ed, Ed, and Eddie, dude, I would have fucking hit those canker sisters raw dog and bailed. Anyways, uh, I'm sitting there racking my brain on what I wanted to talk about. And, uh, and I was thinking about this one. I didn't know if I wanted to talk about it because every person that I've come to to express this they they gotten angry at me. My mom didn't think it was funny. Abby didn't think it was funny. I don't know if it's because I just told it to women or not, but maybe somebody... Oh, my dad didn't think it was funny, but, you know, what the fuck does he know? And uh, <laughs> the only person I kind of chuckled was my brother, and that was because we were at the place at the time when I brought it up. <clears throat> but uh, so me and my brother... And his girlfriend and my wife, we all went down to the aquarium. I think it was the Clearwater Aqu Aquarium, I think. I don't know if you guys know where Clearwater is. It's down in Florida. And uh, Clearwater is not exactly the nicest place, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like. And their aquarium is a perfect example. It's it's like when you see a shitty town, you expect the aquarium is going to be pretty shitty. It's exactly the kind of aquarium I would expect clear water to have <laughs> so abby wanted to go to the aquarium so we could bring madeline to the aquarium my little my little daughter show her all the fishes and stuff and you know that seemed like a good idea i didn't realize we were going to be going to the aquarium quite like this but uh I, you know i thought that was a great idea so we went now first of all when we showed up we, uh, I don't, I didn't know anything about this aquarium. When we showed up, we bought our tickets, and then the lady's like, "Hey, you want to do a photo op? You know where they take your picture and then you buy them afterwards." 
And I, I knowing full well I wasn't going to buy that stupid shit, I was like, sure, why not? So they stood us in front of a green screen, and she just pulls out this, like, plastic fin out of nowhere and gives it to me and tells me to hold it and pose with it. I was like, what the, what the fuck is this? It was like a... It's like a weird peg leg with a, a, a fin on the back of it. And uh, so that was kind of, that, that was my first tip off that this wasn't exactly the most normal aquarium. And uh, and then we went in there and th- the tanks were unusually empty. There wasn't many fish. There wasn't many, uh, uh, much of anything to be honest. And then, uh, but I noticed a lot of the sea turtles and stuff they had were uh, fucked up. They really weren't swimming right. Uh, some of them had like these big bulges in their shells where they couldn't quite go underwater all the way. They had like big air pockets in their shells and, um, (laughs) there were some other issues and it turns out that like, this is an aquarium for wayward, fucked up, genetically fucked up, uh, fish. That's, (laughs) I'm not kidding. That's what it was. Either that or, or animals that had been maimed in some way. And so the star of the fucking show is this dolphin that's got, that got its tail cut off somehow. And that's what the lady gave me at the photo op. She gave me, like, the prosthetic tail to this dolphin. And uh, <clears throat> so every apparently it's a worldwide phenomenon where people come by and go see this fucked up uh, mutant dolphin with a chopped off tail. And uh, with a prosthetic stapled on there. And they really did a hack job with the prosthetics. They tried to, they had a plaque talking about it, how they got like this prosthetics expert. The fucking thing looks like a flipper with some zip ties on it. Was not very impressed, <laughs> to be honest. I could have come up with something better than that. But, uh, uh, you know, I paid good money to bring my daughter to the aquarium to see some fucking fish. I didn't know I was going to be bringing her to see this. A bunch of disabled fish. I don't want to see that shit. It just made me depressed. It made me depressed to see a dolphin with a prosthetic leg. It made me depressed to see a bunch of turtles with their shells all crunched up in air bubbles and they're struggling to just get their head out of the water so they can breathe. It was fucking depressing. I went to the aquarium to have a good time. And I ended up going there. It was like a, it was like paying money to go see shell-shocked victims in like a... a, a <laughs> like a Vietnam retirement home or something. Like, why the fuck would I want to see that? And nobody else, nobody else understood it. Everybody's like, well, I mean, you're there to support them. I was like, I don't want to see that in my spare time. You know what I want to see? I want to pay money to go see perfectly healthy, majestic animals with, behind glass. That's what I want to see. Now, I know it's not ethical. I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, I feel like taking healthy animals... And putting them behind glass and looking at them is a whole lot better uh, than, first of all, running over them with a boat and chopping off their tail, stapling a fucking uh, a fishing fin to them, and then putting them behind glass. This thing knows it's been traumatized. They say dolphins are smart. This thing knows it's been traumatized by humans, and now it's in captivity. My favorite part about this aquarium, though, was uh, there, there was this... Um, there was like a show, right? You know, like a SeaWorld show, but they were, they emphasized a million times over that this was an ethical version of that show. Because at SeaWorld, they they have like a lion tamer kind of guy that goes in there and beats the shit out of the whales until they do their bidding. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, at this particular place, they go in there and they go like, hey, do you wanna? And then the dolphin goes, yeah, sure. I mean, I get fish out of it. Why not? <laughs> and it does a couple of stupid tricks. And if it doesn't feel like it, then it doesn't do it. It's like, hey, you know what? I, I don't even have a fucking tail. I don't want to do anything today. And so they're like, all right, fine. And and uh, and and that got me thinking about it. The I read this story a long time ago of this experiment that was taking place because they they talk about dolphins being so smart, right? They're apparently like the smartest creature besides us and they uh it was an experiment in like the 70s i think where they were trying to teach they they were like hey if we teach a dolphin from birth 
up until adulthood. Like you can't keep teach an old dog new tricks. You know what I'm saying? So if we get a dolphin from birth and we teach it human like things like uh, math and language and stuff, it may be, it, we want to see how far we can uh, educate a dolphin in human related uh, education. We just see how smart they are compared to us. And so they, uh, they had like a classroom that was flooded <laughs> like three feet, right? And uh, and they, this lady would go in there and she would do like um, simple equations, like math stuff on the chalkboard, and then the, the dolphin would answer them. And, uh, and it was going good for a long time. <laughs> and the dolphin was getting better and better. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, the dolphin <laughs> he got hit puberty. It was a male dolphin. And dolphins are one of the few creatures besides humans, and uh, bonobos monkeys, bonobos monkeys. I don't know how you say their name. That uh, that um, have sex for recreation, right? Uh, so dolphins enjoy sex, and apparently this dolphin <laughs> refused to do its math equations. It, it became unruly because you know it's a it's a <laughs> it's a dolphin going through puberty, man. You know, I wouldn't want to do math equations. I got this. I'm the only kid in class. Got this hot ass teacher teaching me shit. This apparently it got to the point where this thing was rubbing its boner up against the teacher. <laughs> it wouldn't do its math until the teacher whacked it off. And so there was a government study happening where the fucking that we were the taxpayers were paying for this lady to whack off a dolphin. Is basically what it was. And uh, apparently some officials came by to see how the, the, the experiment was going. And caught the lady uh, <laughs> dick-handed <laughs> and shut it down. But, uh, you know, uh, all in the name of science. <laughs> I wonder what that lady's resume looks like. So, uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of the few people in the world that's whacked off a dolphin. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm actually going to look this up right now. I'm going to look this up because I want to make sure I'm giving you guys factual information and not some malarkey. This story seemed to break in like 2013, 2014, because that's where like all the uh, the information is, is popping out at. Oh, God, the girl here is actually pretty fucking hot. I'm not going to lie. Um, anyways, so anyways, Peter the Dolphin, it was his name. He was only six. Uh, he was only six years old. He fell in love with a human. The bottlenose dolphin met the research assistant, Margaret Howe. Just as the free love movement was emerging in 1965, who wrote this? This is the New York Post emphasizing the free love movement was happening at the same time, coincidentally, as this lady started uh, uh, masturbating a dolphin in her classroom. <laughs> hey, you know, if you're if you're uh, uh, you're just being a genderist racist asshole, if you think dolphins can't be masturbated by humans. Anyways, uh, Hal was supposed to spend 10 weeks teaching Peter English words, but Peter was more focused on getting to know his teacher in a different way. This is how this is written. As he was sexually coming of age, Hal said, Peter turned hot for his teacher and fell in love. Hal and Peter's star-crossed love story is the focus of the new BBC documentary, The Girl Who Talked to Dolphins. I need to watch this shit. Jesus Christ, there's an entire documentary on it. I'm, I'm, I'm fast-forwarding a little bit. Um... About four weeks into the experiment, Hal wrote in her diary, Peter has become sexually aroused several times this week. <laughs> I find his desires are hindering our relationship. He jams himself again and and again against my legs, circles around me, is inclined to nibble, and generally so excited he cannot control his attitude around me. I'm starting to quake at the at the loins just thinking about this shit. Okay, here we go. Here we, here's the meat and potatoes. This is where I wasn't making shit up. In the trailer for the documentary, Howe explains that she would masturbate Peter to keep him focused. Otherwise, he would not pay attention to her lessons. It was just easy. This is a direct quote from her. It was just easier to incorporate that and let it happen. It was a very precious. It was very gentle. And Peter knew it was right there. Peter was right there. Again, it was sexual on his part, but not sexual on mine. Sensuous, perhaps, she said. It just became part of what was going on, like an itch 
just to get rid of that, scratch it, and we'll be done and move on. Jesus Christ, that late fucking sounds like my wife. After the experiment ended and the lab was closed, Peter was shipped back to Lily's lab in Miami, and his health quickly deteriorated. After A few weeks later, Peter committed suicide with veterinarian Andy Williamson ruling his cause of death a broken heart. Margaret could rationalize it, but when she left, could Peter, Williams said. Here's the love of his life gone. This fuck. <laughs> what? A dolphin. This dolphin committed Sudoku because this lady wasn't whacking him off every day. And if you look at this uh, picture of this lady, dude, she was kind of a catch back in the day. Margaret Howe, you know, she wasn't half bad. Jamie, pull up a picture of Margaret Howe for me. Thanks. I don't actually have a Jamie. It's just me in post. <laughs> I'm just adding it after the fact. <laughs> Back to originally what brought me here. That's the kind of shit I wanted to see at that aquarium. I wanted to see some people whacking off dolphins, fully functional dolphins. Nothing wrong with them. Instead, I went there and it was like a Frankenstein's monster aquarium. Not only that, but the, the enclosures themselves were poorly made out of shittily made concrete. The whole thing was gloomy and grim, kind of uh, gross and disgusting. It just it was not a family friendly affair. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, although I did get touch of stingray, which warmed my heart. <laughs> I'm looking through my notes for few, for the podcast, like, you know, things I could talk about. And all I have on here is. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, the biggest news that you guys are going to hear this week, Chick-fil-A in my town is adding yet another drive through <laughs> I don't know why I put that in here to talk about. Every Chick-fil-A in town has a, a double-decker drive through You ever seen those? McDonald's tries, McDonald's like tries to add them because you know, they think that they need them. There, there's not a McDonald's in town that actually has a backed up drive through line that I ever see. But Chick-fil-A, on the other hand, gets so backed up that it comes around the side of the building and then out to the main thoroughfare road. So that like the right hand lane to the road is just bumper to bumper with people trying to get in there and order food. So to solve that, they did a double decker drive through like two lanes. And even now still it's backed up into the road. So now they're like, let me rack my brain and figure out what we could do. Add another lane. So I can, they, they have a triple decker drive through. It's the only restaurant I've ever seen like that. And what's, what cracks me up about Chick-fil-A is there's one right next to a Burger King, right? And during lunchtime, you should see the Burger King workers. They're just standing in there. There's not a fucking soul in Burger King. And they're, the two buildings are adjacent to each other. Chick-fil-A, people will park in the Burger King parking lot to walk next door to Chick-fil-A. And the people in Burger King are just staring out the windows like that work there. Knowing that one day their Burger King's going to close down. There's no way it can stay open. <laughs> I've never seen a soul in there. Let's move on to the next point. But this one's uh, uh, topical. This one's, uh, what's that called? Social commentary, right? Where it has uh, stuff to actually do. We're not talking about dolphins getting whacked off anymore. We're talking about serious stuff. We're talking about racial issues in America. And what we're going to talk about here is, uh, is about cops. And actually, it's not about cops at all. It's about how races treat each other. And I'm not talking about how white people treat black people or how black people treat white people because there is a racist... Uh, issue with racism in America. What I'm going to talk about is how white people treat white people and black people treat black people. See, this is the reason why America is uh, slowly becoming more, what's the word for it? Um, uh, I, I would say the downtrodden are becoming very vocal, all right? Because black people have each other's backs. They do. White people don't give a fuck about each other. Let's be honest. <laughs> we don't give a shit. We, we, uh, everybody, all white people make fun of white trash. We don't fucking care about each other. Uh, you know, I've never stopped to help a white person once in my fucking life, and I never will. <laughs> but I, uh, I was looking at uh, two very similar things, right? One was, uh, it was a guy. 
first of all, actually, it's worse on the white end when you think about it. The um, uh, one video was uh, a black guy that got pulled over by the cops. Now, the truth of the matter, you can go watch, uh, like, a, I'm sure, Donut Operator or some fucking guy like that's made a video about it. But this guy, it's it's this clip on Twitter, and, of course, all it is is him getting arrested, and the cop's like, yo, fucking put your hands behind your back. And the guy's like, nah, son, I ain't gonna do it. And then the cop's like, you know, that's his job, so he's gonna take you in. And then it gets violent because he's not complying. Like the, like the guy, everybody acts like the cop's going to be the guy's like, no, I'm not going to. And the cop's going to be like, oh well, shit. I, okay. Okay. I'm out of here. And then just hops in his car and drives away. No, he's, if he's saying, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest. It's going to happen. It's that's one of those things. That's just, it's out of your control. It's going to happen anyways. So this guy, this black guy's like, Hey, I'm not going to get arrested. And the cop's like, yes, you are. <laughs> it's going to like a rapist. It's going to happen. <laughs> and the uh, and, and and so he calls for a backup. And the whole time, the, uh, the guy's girlfriend is filming. And she's like, please stop resisting. Just put your hands behind your fucking back. And her boyfriend's like, nah, son, I ain't going to do it. And so the cops get there. And, uh, yeah, they're pretty rough with him, trying to get his arms behind his back. And they slap him in uh, handcuffs. And, uh, and everybody's upset. Well, it turns out the fucking guy was driving like 85, 90 miles per hour in a 45 or something like that. And he had a kid in the car. Like it was, he was a total dickhead. He deserved to get arrested. But you know, that's besides the point. The real point is, is that if you go to the comments under the video, black people, dude, without even knowing who this guy is, what he's done, they have his back. They were like, this is unjust. That cop should get fired. What the fuck? We're getting hunted down. The white man has it in for us. Just stepping up to bat for this guy without even knowing him. You know? And uh, and that was touching. Because uh, on the other end of it, uh, shortly, like, scrolling down my Twitter feed, uh, directly under that, I found a video of uh, a grandma. And watching that video of the black guy, uh, it pulls on your heartstrings a little bit. It does. Uh, even knowing that he he's you know kind of in the wrong driving around like a maniac with a kid in the car but uh watching this grandma it was like a comedy movie it was this lady she was like 65 years old old grandma with her little white fucking hair and she gets pulled over by a cop and the cop's like hey uh how long has your fucking taillight been out or something like that i forget what it was and she's like oh it's been out about six months <laughs> No, it was a registration. Her registration was out for like six months. That's what it was. And uh, and the cop's like, oh, okay. He gives her a ticket for like 80 bucks. And she goes, he's like, I need you to sign for this. It's a ticket for $80. And she's like, I'm not going to sign for that. He's like, well, ma'am, you have to sign for it. And she's like, no, you're not going to give me a warning. He's like, yeah, I would have given you a warning if it was like a month late. But you've had six months that you've known this is fucking wrong, right? And she goes, I ain't going to sign for that. I'm not get, if you when you start being fair with me, I'll start being fair with you. And he's like, "All right, ma'am, get out of the car because now she's under arrest, right? She's uh, um, what's that called? Resisting, right? And so, uh, in in retaliation, she's like, "Oh, I'll take this up a notch." <laughs> so she starts rolling up her window, and she's gonna crank the car, and the cops like, "Oh, you dumb bitch!" She's like, "If you start that fucking car, you're in for a world of hurt." <laughs> And she's like, nah, no, you be fair with me. I be fair with you. And so she rolls down her window a little bit. And he's like, ma'am, don't you do it. <laughs> and she goes, just give me the paper. I'll sign it. And he's like, oh, we're way past that. Hop out of the car. And she's like, no. So she cranks up the car and starts driving away. Cop gets in his car, chases her down, pulls her over again, hops out of his car and pulls out his gun on approach. <laughs> she's immediately like frantic right because all of a sudden she's getting approached by a cop with a gun he drags her out of the car and ends up like throwing this dumb bitch face down on the ground she's all old and shit so you know it's like totally jarring to her getting thrown around like a rag doll and he starts like putting her arms behind her back she's resisting he pepper sprays that old bitch <laughs> He gets her in the face with mace. It's this old grandma getting pepper sprayed. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. And uh, and then uh, he eventually gets her in handcuffs, and she's crying and shit. And if you go down to the comments, <laughs> this is the difference between races. It is nothing but white people 
in the comments going, ha ha, you dumb bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get you fucking idiot and there's not a single person that feels bad for her. and she's just old it's like it's like watching betty white get fucking suplexed down a staircase we don't give a shit about each other and it was like i don't know if that in and of itself is sad that we just like that's the white people way you just kick each other in the ribs as you're stomping your way up to the top you don't give a fuck about anybody else and uh <laughs> but it was just a stark contrast because they were right next to each other in my Twitter feed. Like it was this guy that had done wrong things and was getting arrested for it. Totally justified. And you're, and everybody's like getting his back. And then this old lady that had done hardly anything wrong <laughs> gets pepper sprayed and beaten the shit out of. And you, uh, you know, you don't feel bad for her. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe I'm just a scumbag. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I'm not because everybody else in the comments were making fun of her too. She was just kind of an entitled ass. So was the other guy. But uh, uh, I, I don't know what the difference is. If anybody has any insight as to why you would feel bad for one and not the other, you let me know. And truth be told, if I'm going to be real with you, son, if I'm going to be real, real with you, um, I really don't have any sympathy for anybody that resists arrests and, and then is appalled by the consequences it's that's once again, that's one of those situations where it sucks. And even though you're in the right or in the wrong, doesn't matter. I mean, just get arrested. Your time to fight. It's in court, not there on the side of the fucking road. <laughs> that guy's not the, he's not the judge. He's not there to determine what's right and what's wrong. He's just there to call it as he sees it. You know, if he's wrong, you go see the judge about it. This that turned really serious, but you see a bunch and not another thing though, is I've noticed people get pulled over and they have like their hand in their lap, dude, my hands are way fucking up. I look like I'm doing uh moose antlers on my steering wheel. When I get pulled over, I have those things out, dude, on top of my steering wheel. And I, and I try to get all my shit together before the cop even approaches my window. But if I don't, I'm just, I just tell them like, look, I'm reaching for my registration. I'm reaching for my license and I'm going to do it slow. And if you shoot me in the face, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> and also, uh, uh, I try to, uh, you know, do some small talk before, you know, kind of get them off, uh, get them off edge. You know, they get all angry and stuff like right off the bat. If you dr drove too long without pulling over and stuff, I had one lady do that. I got pulled over and I drove for a while and then pulled off into a side road into the grass on the shoulder and it was I was like in the grass in a way where I couldn't drive away like make an escape and she's like why the hell did you take so long to pull over and I just go like well the road we were on was a fucking death trap I don't want you <laughs> getting hit by a car and smeared across the side of my car like Jesus Christ <laughs> she was like oh well I do appreciate that because we did lose an officer to that very thing this month I'm like yeah I did I mean, I was kind of watching out for my car, not really her, but <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to have to fucking scrape this bitch off the quarter panel of my my fucking stupid Element. <laughs> yeah, I drive a man's car, Honda Element. <laughs> yeah, this isn't even on my list, dude. I went to go see. Uh, um, I went to go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, over my birthday weekend, dude. What a movie! What a fucking movie! You know. I've always, when you go see a movie, even if it's critically acclaimed or whatever, um, I try not to, everybody does this to a degree, right? But I try not to do this where you go see something and then you really, you're sitting there having like an internal dilemma on whether or not it was good, what you thought of it. And then you go see someone else's review and you're like, okay, it's okay to think that this was a good movie or it's okay to think this was a bad movie now that I have some, some backup consensus that it's bad or good. That movie, I think my, my internal um, critic says that if you go see a movie, doesn't matter how great of a movie it is critically de like seen as, right? If you go see a movie and then days afterwards you're still thinking about it, that's how you know it's a good movie. And so uh, I have been thinking about once upon a time in Hollywood, it's now Wednesday and I saw it on Sunday morning and every day I've been thinking about it. 
I, like, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie or what it's about, but that, you know, can I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. You know what? Spoilers, spoiler alert up ahead. There's going to be some, uh, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood talk. All right. So if you haven't seen the movie, it's about Charles Manson. Uh, it, well, actually it's not about Charles Manson. He comes in later, but, uh, it's about a, uh, uh, kind of like a Western back in the, the golden era of Hollywood, uh, the Western movie star and his stunt man, uh, kind of having a floundering career at the tail end of what they see as their career. And they're having a hard time transitioning into modern movies after the end of like the Western era. Right. And, uh, you meet he, the the guy who's Leonardo DiCaprio is uh he ends up trying to do doing like little TV show parts and stuff like that, but he's trying to get his big transitioning break moment. He happens to be neighbors with uh, his newfound neighbor that just that just moved in next door is Roman Polanski, and his wife is Sharon Tate. Now, if you guys aren't history buffs or anything, you'll know that Sharon Tate is uh, um, she was pregnant at the time and the Manson family broke into her house, fucking stabbed her to death and uh, killed the baby too. She was pregnant and everything. Killed a couple other people that were at the house. And so in the movie, you have a lot of scenes where it shows uh, the Manson family and what they're doing. Charles Manson at one point visits the Polanski residence and, uh, and then there's a, uh, a couple scenes where you follow Sharon Tate around and you get to understand her character and it makes you feel for her character. And so you're sitting there the whole movie. And if you know Sharon Tate's story, you're like, ah, at some point these two paths are going to enter, like they're going to cross. Right. And, uh, (laughs) DiCaprio's character, the Western actor, dude, He has, like, you can tell he has a yearning to talk to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate because they're the, he's like Drake, right? You know, Drake is like uh, a rapper that's been around, but his, like, his career is always on the edge of falling off. And then he sees someone rising up and he goes, hey, let's collaborate. Let's, let's get that new sound that you know that I don't know because I'm old fucking geezer with a weird hairline. So, uh, <laughs> so that's what, uh, that's what DiCaprio is doing. He's like, I want to meet Roman Polanski. He's, he just came out with Rosemary's baby. It's like the biggest movie right now. Sharon Tate's a rising star. If we can somehow get into their little circle of friends, I can be somebody again. It can save my career. And, uh, and so you're thinking that all these paths are going to cross, right? The final section of the film is so fucking cool to me. Like, that's all I've been thinking about. Because the Manson family's coming up the road, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, shit, they're going to break into the Sharon Tate's house. They're going to kill that bitch and her stupid baby. And then it it turns out the last second, they decide to kill Rick Dalton, who's Leonardo DiCaprio. And Leonardo DiCaprio's stuntman, Brad Pitt, goes ham, egg, and cheese on him and kills them all. And DiCaprio ends up flamethrowing some bitch in a pool. So <laughs> together they kill all the Manson people. And then, uh, and uh, Sharon Tate it, hears about it and invites him up to her house for drinks. And so like, it's like a weird alternate history thing. And the, the genius part to me for some reason is Tarantino has always been great with music. He's always been great with music in his movies, but there's like this soundtrack that plays. I don't know what song it is, but Sharon Tate just invites him up for drinks and you can see it in Rick's face that this is his career break right here. This is the point where the sky's the limit. He's getting a second chance at a career. And this is also coincidentally the point where alternate history begins because in reality, the Manson family walks right up that driveway and kills him, kills Sharon Tate, right? So DiCaprio, like the the gates to the driveway open and like this music plays and he fucking, it's like some weird ethereal soundtrack. It's it's almost like dreamlike in a way because it is a dream. It's like a dream of what could be. And he walks up that driveway 
and it's it's like an eerie thing. And I didn't, I wasn't even old enough to know Sharon Tate, but I feel like this movie would be really cool for someone like my mom to see, you know, because my mom, like she grew up and she knows of Sharon Tate. I mean, she's seen movies that Sharon Tate was in and she knows of the Manson family, even someone older than my mom, like a decade older, where like in their teens, Sharon Tate's movies were out there that I think it would be a really cool movie to see. And a lot of people see it and they're like, eh, I don't, I, I don't know. I thought it was an incredible movie. I don't see how you could not like it. Not only that, but somebody on, on Twitter brought this up and I didn't even think about this. Um, but this movie is Tarantino's most feel good, happy go lucky movies he's ever made. And that is the most true thing in the world because it, it, until the very end, it covers just normal subject matter. It's not like this over the top, gruesome subject matter like Inglorious Bastards was, like Django Unchained was. Uh, Pulp Fiction wasn't that bad, but uh, Reservoir Dogs starts off with like the guy bleeding from the stomach and everything. This movie is probably in line with like Jackie Brown, but more happy in tone. It's just a happier movie, man. And it, it's it. I, I fucking love it. I want to see it again in theaters. I want to see it again. It was incredible. Except for you know what the only problem was is I sat down to uh, to watch the movie and the introduction happens, which is a, a scene in the trailer where they're like, uh, um, it, "This is in like the early '60s, I think, is when they're they're filming this section." But it's like a little junket for a TV show talking about. Uh, uh, DiCaprio and Brad Pitt and how he's a stunt man and stuff. And after that intro sequence is finished, then the actual movie starts. And about that time I realized I really, really have to piss. And there is no chance in hell I'm going to get up and piss in the middle of this fucking movie. <laughs> so I just sat there like, Oh, by the end of it, dude, it felt like my kidneys were going to burst. I, I, I went there to pee after the movie and Abby was waiting on me. She was like, Jesus Christ, was there a fucking line? I was like, no, there wasn't a line at all. I was just standing over the toilet. Have you ever had one of those where you're just peeing so long? You're just like, <laughs> is something wrong? <laughs> it won't stop coming out. You've lost all sensation to your bladder. So you don't even know if it's uh, the only confirmation I have that I'm still peeing is I'm looking down, watching it come out. <laughs> Yeah, man, that was, uh, uh, but even with the piss, the, the piss feeling, that was a great movie. I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I do feel like sometimes Tarantino's movies have sections that I wish could be taken out. That seem kind of self-indulgent, maybe not necessary. That movie, I enjoyed every bit of it, every single bit of it. And there wasn't a single section of it where I was like, oh, they should take this out. I just bumped the fucking camera with my foot. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> if you're watching this, I'm sorry about that. If you're listening to it, well, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think this is the end of this one. Thanks for watching this episode of 4 Ed Fables Podcast, episode five or something. I'm sorry this one's a little bit late. I got caught up doing Minecraft stuff. I've been, I, I have like five videos in the works, and for some reason I just haven't. I just need to sit down and make them. And uh, so I haven't had time to sit there and hit this thing up. Our next guest is probably, I'm not even going to say, just in case he doesn't come on. So uh, uh, I'll see you guys next time. I appreciate you hanging out. And uh, you guys have a wonderful day.